Psalm chapter 21, and that's what we're going to do today. Talk about rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. Uh, but I'd like to start this morning by simply asking a question. Uh, and that question is, when was the last time you cried? About something that upsets you, I'll put it that way. About three days ago. <coughs> Some of you guys probably would have a hard time admitting to when that was or what it was for. Uh, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or anything, but I want you to keep the question in your mind as we go through this sermon today. So you'll probably, you're going to have to think back on this, but you probably remember seeing uh, this scripture uh, some time ago. It's from Ezra 1, 2, and 3. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judea and rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. The way things have worked out with our uh, scheduling, uh, that was quite some time ago. And you'll remember, that's, this is the first time over the course of years, there will be a number of transitions between places. And we usually call them waves. This is going to be the first wave of Israelites that actually get to go home for the first time. So, King Cyrus set up for this first wave to go back. And the reason we call it waves is because we're several generations down the road now. So all these exiles that are in uh, Babylonia and, and Persia and all these different places around the known world Many of them have established for themselves homesteads. And whereas they probably are living in Jewish communities, they made the decision not to go back to Jerusalem at this particular time. So when King Cyrus comes along, he says, yes, you can go back if you would like and rebuild your temple. This was an important thing. This was the first wave. And you'll notice a lot of people got excited. And that's exactly what they did. They went back and they started working on the temple and they're all pumped up. And by the time they got the foundation done, they got tired and they lost their focus. Remember that big long sermon? They lost their focus. In fact, they lost their focus so bad they lost it for 60 years. They stopped working on the temple for 16 years. Until finally a guy comes along and has had enough and he lights a, a fire under their backsides and they get it all done. This is a picture of probably what the temple looked like. It's a rendition of uh, that particular temple at that particular time. Now, the temple, you hear, you hear a lot talk about the temple. The temple was huge to the Israelites. It was because it was not only a temple, it was the temple. This was the consecrated place of God's residence. This is where God physically lived with the Jewish people. And they understood this. So the temple was huge. And as you know from today's chapter, which I hope everybody read, a second wave of Israelites decided to come back. And this time they came back under the leadership of the prophet Ezra, the guy who wrote that, uh, that scripture. But when Ezra arrives in Jerusalem, he finds that the people have regressed yet again. He, he sees them having lost their focus and gone back to exactly what was important to them, themselves. 
So Ezra goes and he gives this very long chastising uh, speech. And he makes everybody repent and turn back, turn their hearts back to God. Now, here's a very important part of our chapter today. I'm going to kind of just zip through the chapter part, and then we're going to go to uh, the highlights of what's important about this particular chapter. But another important aspect of this chapter was the time when a group of guys got together, and this time they go from Jerusalem to Persia. Now you have to understand, there's two ways already been back in Jerusalem, and still more Israelites living around the known world in Babylon and Persia and all over the place. So it's not uncommon to think, and this is all in the territory at this point, so it's not uncommon to realize that extended families are going to be on both ends, and they're occasionally going to get up and they're going to go travel back and forth to see one another. So this isn't an uncommon thing that these guys decided to get together and go to Persia. And they shared news of their homeland with a guy by the name who we read in our car worship this morning, a guy by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was Jewish. But he had a very important job in Persia. He was the cupbearer to the king of Persia, who was now Artaxerxes, which was the son of crazy Xerxes. Cupbearer's job back then was hugely important. It was, it had so much responsibility with it and so much trust with it because this was the food taster and the drink taster. This was the guy who tasted all the food for the king that the king was going to eat to the drink of all the drinks that the, that the king was going to engage in. Because back in those days, if you wanted to assassinate a king, the best way to do it was by poison. So the cupbearer's job was hugely important and a position of very high trust. So the guys come in and they see Nehemiah and they tell him about the homeland. And this is the report that he gets. <coughs> Han and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some men who had just arrived from Judea. I asked them about the Jews who had returned from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well. For those who have returned to the province of Judea, they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. We talk, we talk a lot about the wall around a lot of cities, uh, Jerusalem maybe one of them, uh, and the importance of that wall. And the importance of the wall to a city back then was huge. It was huge because it was their defense. And as a matter of fact, it was so important to those people back then that they had a saying that went something like this. As goes the wall, so goes the city. That's how important the wall was. So just as Cyrus let the people go back and rebuild the temple, God influenced Cyrus to let the people do that and rebuild the temple. Now, Crazy Xerxes Jr. is talked to by God who's going to let yet a third way go back and rebuild the wall. And he's going to put Nehemiah in charge. I hope you take the time to read this story because it's a great story full of opposition and intrigue. Uh, but we're going to fast forward right now to the end. And the end says this. Uh, I can read it. On October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 <coughs> days after it had begun. 52 days. This is miraculous in and of itself. This wall is 
in most places, 12 foot tall. It's eight foot thick, and it goes for about two and a half miles around Jerusalem. 52 days is unbelievable. My feelings about this is that, quite frankly, I don't think, I think God wanted things to kind of roll, roll along at this point. I don't think, even though they had their problems in building the wall, I think he kind of, he let it kind of go like butter because he didn't want the people to lose their focus again. He wanted this job done. Remember I told you, God's going to get his upper story done one way or the other. In this case, he gives Nehemiah. But they did it in miraculous form, 52 days to build a wall of that magnitude. So that's kind of the end of the story. And I looked at the story and I said, okay, I want to bring some of this story to the 21st century. What's our 21st century lessons? Are we going to learn in this story? And I found several that were really good, but I found one that just captivated me. It really grabbed me, and I think, I hope that it grabs you too. And that one thing comes when Nehemiah is first hearing about uh, the wall being broken down and how bad things are. This is what Nehemiah says after that. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. I always get the biggest kick out of that particular uh, verses. Because to me it's funny. To me it's, who ever heard of a cup bearer fasting? I mean, if I were a bad guy back then, I'd just wait for the governor to go on uh, a fast. And then I'd poison the king. Maybe it's only me that's fun, too. <laughs> you get the picture here. Nehemiah is tore up. Uh, he's beyond just a little upset. It, this is guy's heart tore up. But if you follow theology and all the little nuances that you find in these scriptures, you have to ask yourself the question, why is Nehemiah tore up? First of all, Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem. He was born in exile. He was born a Jew, but lived as much with the Persians as he did with the Jews. I'll tell you something else about this wall. It's not in the scripture, but it's a fact. This wall in Jerusalem has been down for over a hundred years. This is not the news. So the question is, again, I ask, why is this scripture here? Why is that scripture there? Why is it that Nehemiah gets all upset at this particular time about the wall right now. I think in order to answer the question, we have to look back at Nehemiah's parents. I think they belong to what I call the little guys. The little, they got exiled, and there's a little mom and pop shop with two and a half kids, and they end up in Persia. But they're the ones that remember God's command to teach my commands to your children. From the time they had me and my brothers and sisters were little, I think that mom and dad instilled these commandments in them. But not only that, the entire Torah, the entire history and heritage of their people, hugely important. Now remember, even though these words, these are only words, in Nehemiah's mind right now. They involve a place that, what do we call it? We called it the temple. God loves, or Nehemiah loves God, and God's house is in Jerusalem, unprotected by this wall. 
Nehemiah wouldn't have had these people like the Sarah Mama there and not done what God had said. Something else I think, Nehemiah experienced something that each and every one of us experiences several times in our lives. And that's knowing something here and having to travel from there to here. When I die, I want you to teach your children this from PJ. One of the longest trips a man can make is from knowing something here to realizing something here. About four weeks ago, I spoke from the Word and from my heart about the state of affairs of our finances. And it was my prayer that it was my prayer then and still is that this information get from here to here. And in some cases, it hasn't shown up so much down on the board down street yet, but in some cases, I saw that it did. That ought to be the prayer. I'll tell you when this actually happened to me one time. Way back when, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. Well, you saw it on the internet, you saw it on the newspaper, you saw it on the television, you saw it on the, oh, I heard it on the radio. You, you go outside and there's signs everywhere. You couldn't have existed in the United States back at that time and not known the devastation that Katrina caused. You couldn't have. I knew it back then. I watched television. I didn't watch commercials back then. Back then, I sat in front of the television and I watched all of the coverage. <laughs> but for whatever reason, it wasn't until a year later when the New Orleans Saints played their first home game back in their stadium on Monday Night Football against the Atlanta Falcons. And the pregame show, it showed all that devastation that had occurred one year earlier. This time, when I watched it, for whatever reason, it made me cry. I grieved over what I was seeing. And I realized that at that moment, this information had moved from here to here. So that's my challenge to all of you here in the 21st century. All of us. In this world of instant telecommunications around the world, we have information, we have news, bad news, bombarding us 24-7. So much so that nothing settles up here. It goes so fast, one thing is barely registered and the next thing takes over. Far too much information for anything made from here to here. But it's important occasionally for the information to get here. It's important. Because just like Nehemiah, he didn't give two shakes about the wall around Jerusalem until the information went to here to here. And then what did he do? It took that to happen before he took action. I don't know, I still don't watch the news, the newspapers, listen to the radio, or any of that stuff. And that's just me putting limits on this Instant telecommunication. I still know what's going on out there. But unless I can slow it down in my head somehow, that information isn't going to move out of my head. But when it does, when God wants it to go from one place to another, He'll see to it that it goes from here to here. And when that happens, when that happens, you'll know it's God. No, no, he wants you to take action. Amen. Amen. All right.
Chairman handles the offering of the community in the county, number 434.